Anywho, we are live. What is up, everybody? And welcome to episode 20. Episode 20 of the Hot Stove Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Nunez. Here, as always, with my co-hosts. Josh. Mark. Uh, one of the black images you see. I'm one of those people. <laughs> Do you know which? You want to give us a clue as to which one you are? I believe I'm the one on the far right. Like mm. the like the Makes boy? The like yeah, the, little, the, the, the little, yeah, it looks like uh, the sun on the right. Yeah. Where did this picture come from? Because I know you said you were the Adams your screenshots. Uh, I that? believe I believe it was part of my screenshots. I don't, right, and not, you know not, where that picture originated. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's a game of um, Scribble out of IO. Ah, and it looks like I, a bot. Yeah. Looks like a bot came in and um, dominated. You know, just part, painted a perfect picture. Of was it family. the Adams family? I believe it was just family. And you know, no normal human is drawing that on a computer. It wouldn't be a hot soap episode without Mark taking a phone call during a recording, by the way. I just like to point that out. At least this time, oh, he didn't mute himself. Never mind. I was going to say, at least this time he muted himself, which is not true. But um, we are going to get to some, um, some quick housekeeping stuff. And then we've got a good show for you tonight. But in the meantime, first, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Hot Stove Pod. That's at Hot Stove Pod on Twitter. Make sure to follow us over there. And also on the YouTube side, make sure to smash that subscribe button, smash the like button, smash that notification button, and leave a comment if you feel like commenting. So that is um, that is that in terms of housekeeping. I got a couple of college basketball things I want to point out. I wanted to talk about it before we started recording, but did you guys see that undefeated Baylor is down five to two win Iowa State halfway through the second half? I did see that. Wow. Illinois, yeah. fifth ranked Illinois lost to Michigan State tonight, unranked. Yeah. Um, and my housemate did just text me, so we're getting smacked by Rutgers and then beating Illinois the next day about Michigan State. My housemate uh, is not much of a college basketball fan, um, but that's what he just said to me. So, yeah, um, college basketball was weird this year. That's the easiest way to put it. Uh, in other news, Villanova's up by 20 on St. John's. Uh, that doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Um, what, the, what the hell was I going to say? Oh, yeah, okay. A um, couple of things um, before we start. So today we're going to be doing our – MLB off-season recap slash way too early season preview kind of deal. We'll probably revisit this um, March 30th, which is our last show before uh, opening day. Uh, so we'll revisit this topic. But I think this show, we're going to go over the off-season, kind of talk about where teams stand after making some big moves and whatnot. And then at the end of March, we'll go through and make our like division predictions and award predictions and that kind of stuff. So we'll have two separate MLB preview shows Almost. Um, but first, what I want to do is I want to make a little bit of an announcement. Uh, the first, uh, that being, um, remember when we did our fantasy basketball draft live on air? It was a hit. It's our it's our most viewed episode of the podcast so far. Um, we're doing it again, but this time with baseball. So March 23rd, the week before uh, opening day, that Tuesday night at 9.30 p.m., we will be recording our hot stove fantasy baseball draft. Now, what that means is that we've got some open spots. Uh, in terms of spots that we don't have filled, it's a 12-team league. We have six people at the moment. Um, seven? Or did you oh, count? I haven't joined yet. Yes, I have counted you and Austin okay. and the people who haven't joined yet, including everybody that I know has said yes to me. Uh, we have six total people in the league currently, so we have six remaining spots left. It's a five-by-five five head-to-head categories league, standard hitting categories, and on the pitching side, wins have been replaced with innings pitched, and saves have been replaced with saves plus bolts. So uh, that Tuesday night, the 23rd, we'll be doing our draft live on air, so uh, make sure to tune into that. And if you uh, want into the league, either, I guess, leave a comment if you're coming to this video fresh, not knowing any of us. Leave a, leave a comment if you want to be in the hot stove league. If not, Honestly, just text one of the four of us and we'll send you the link to be in the league. Um, well, the fun thing about it is um, this year what we're doing is we are theming the league. Um, so our league is called 
the Hot Stove MILB Invitational. Um, so each of us will be picking a minor league affiliate team to represent in this league. Um, and we will be running with that. I don't know. I thought it was going to be something kind of fun to do. Um, so, uh, um, well, I think, we'll, I think, well, I mean, Josh and Austin, do you guys know what team you're going to pick? Because Adam took the Pensacola Blue Wahoos or. Uh, I, I have not made that decision yet. No. Okay. I've been doing some research. Uh, I believe if, if it's not taken, I'm, I'm going to be the uh, Binghamton uh, Rumble Ponies. It is not taken yet. That's a good one. All right, so I have chosen like, also. I've chosen the Akron Rubber Ducks, which is the Double uh, A affiliate of the Cleveland Baseball Club. And uh, Mark, you've taken the Hartford Yard Goats. What organization is that part of? Yes, Double A for the Colorado Rockies, my favorite minor league team. I have a shirt and everything. Wow, the Double A affiliate of the Rockies yep. plays in Hartford, Connecticut. Yes, they do. Interesting. <laughs> Certainly, I agree. It's ridiculous. All right, That's yeah. Passion. So I, I mean, there's a big old list on Google. If you Google like best minor league team names, there's a list of like twenty something that come up that are fantastic. And I wish I could use them all, but I decided on the Rubber Ducks myself. Let me let me pull up some the list here. Uh, uh, it's funny you say that because I think that's exactly what I looked up to find this team name. Oh, absolutely. We've got classics like the Montgomery Biscuits. We've got the Toledo Mud Hens. Mm-hmm. The Richmond Flying Squirrels. One of my personal favorites, the Modesto Nuts, which is just their logo is just a picture of a peanut and a pistachio or a walnut. My bad. Um, what else do we got here? The uh, Fort Wayne I, Tin I Cap. I personally like the – I like the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. Yeah. That's another classic. The Fort Wayne yeah. Tin Caps, the single-A affiliate of the Padres. Um, uh, let's see here. The Hickory Crawdads. Uh, Savannah Sand Nats. <laughs> the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp, the double-A affiliate of the, Mar- of the Marlins. Yeah, there's some great names out there. So uh, if you want in on the league, let us know. We'll have some fun. Um, in other fantasy news, we're bringing FanDuel back. That's what we're doing this weekend. So this upcoming weekend, we got the WGC Workday Championship uh, in golf. Um I don't, I've never heard of this tournament before, but a lot, uh, I mean, all the whole high profile golfers are golfing in it. So I assume it's at least like moderately important. Um, is that true to anybody who has a knowledge of golf? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty solid tournament. No they usually get a good turnout. Yeah. Well, cause I know we ju- we've just come off the, the Genesis and the waste management invitational in the last couple of weeks. So, um, mm-hmm. I guess they're, we're keeping it rolling as of right now, but yeah, we are doing a hot soap contest for it. So, uh, we're going to talk about our lineups right now. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how similar they are because I assume they're probably going to be pretty similar. I don't know. Who wants to go first? Talk about their lineup for this golf tournament this weekend. Rocket. I can. Oh, oh you go. Ahead, no, go. No. Sweater vest, by all means, please. Uh, this is not a sweater vest. It is a sweater. Yeah, Thank but you, you got the tuck under. You got the tuck under do fancy the, shirt. I do have the button. Take it fancy. Yeah. You can go. Um, <laughs> So I went with the strategy of three reasonably priced golfers and then three like all stars, if you will. Uh, Seventy four hundred. Can't believe he is this cheap. Cameron Champ. He hasn't mm. had the best like cut percentage so far this season, but he's the only one who hits the ball consistently almost as far as DeChambeau. Like DeChambeau has got him an average driving distance by like seven yards. Okay. So this guy crushes the ball. He's really good. He, he's only made four out of nine cuts in the new season, so I understand that makes him a little cheaper, but the guy's a really good golfer. I was shocked to see him that low. Um, next, I got Kevin Kisner, the Kiz, the main man. This ain't no hobby. You know, one of the most fun players on tour. That's my favorite thing he says. Like, someone will, like, critique his swing. He's like, man, this ain't no hobby. Mm. They call him the match play assassin. He's one of few Ooh. people to have beaten Tiger Woods in a match play scenario. Ooh, um, oh, yeah. he's a killer. This is not a match play event. I just really like Kevin Kisner. Uh, next, we're going with the young fella, Abraham Answer. He's at 8,100. Kisner was at 7,900, by the way. Isner's just a made cut machine, eight out of 10, 80 points of tournament. Like just, he's one of those solid guys that you can get for a middle price range that I think should 
belong in everybody's lineup heading into this weekend. Um, then I got the three big boys. I got Dustin Johnson, Xander Shoffley, and Patrick Cantlay. I mean, these guys just win tournaments. None of them have missed a cut this year. I don't expect that to change at the WGC workday. Uh, so I, I think the three of them are being able to get the three of them in my lineup with $1,300 remaining, mind you, uh, is a, yeah, is a pretty good bargain. Yeah. I love, I, yeah. What were we going to say, Josh? Go for it. No, I love that you were like the three big boys and I have three big boys, but pretty much the other three. Oh, okay. I also have, uh, three fairly highly priced golfers. Of I'll yeah, go next because I know nothing about this, right? Boys. Um, I'm picking guys that I've started to uh, – now, as I've started to watch golf a little bit more with my housemates, I've started to latch on to a couple of guys uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, like them on the tour. I didn't get Louis Hazen in there this time around, uh, but I am a fan of the South African. Anyways, uh, my lineup in terms of uh, how lowest price to highest price, right? First, 8,100. Mark already talked about him. Abraham Answer. He's the man. That's all I need to say. 8,400, the Wolf of Wall Street, Matt Wolf coming in there. <laughs> Boom, right? 9,800, Joaquin Neiman made all of his cuts so far this season. 99 points per tournament. Give me that all day at 9,800. Then at uh, 10-4, we got uh, Pat Reed. Uh, I, I don't know too much about him. I just know that he's probably – is he the cheater guy? Yeah, no. he's the cheater guy. That's oh, it. oh, okay. Well, Boo. I like cheaters. That's just like Austin's favorite thing about the uh, guys who have a no contest in MMA, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. You can't lose. I mean, you got the you got the edge. I mean, you might as well pick them because they're right. going to have yeah. an edge for you. Right. It shows, it shows you've got tenacity, right? Mm. Uh, and then, you know, one of my favorite golfers, probably the most one of the most jacked golfers on the tour, if not the most jacked golfer on the tour. He, this man is yoked. I got Rory McIlroy at 11 6. Uh, and then Xander Shalalalalalala Lawfully at uh, 11 7, closing out my lineup. Thank you. I like it. I like it. I, uh, I am not a Xander guy a bit. I don't know. I just I, I can't get behind the Xander train. But uh, ride, it, ride it into the sunset, boys. My six, I'll go with the repeats. I also have Kiz represent Mark, the center hobby. Uh, Patrick Reed also, Nunez, I'm riding with you. You know, you got to get that edge somehow. You got yeah. uh We'll go from cheapest now at this point. We got uh, Sebastian Munoz. Uh, got him out there really just for the price. He was the, the last way. The way I do the golf ones is I try and find the most expensive guys I like first, and then whatever I got left, I'll just sort it together. Mm. Uh, after him goes up to, I mean, just – the second place man, the last like three events, he's finished in second. It's time for him to finally break through, baby. He wins it this week. Tony Finau. They've been saying that for four oh, years. Yeah, I mean, ever <laughs> since he rolled his ankle at Augusta, he's been the hottest thing in golf that's never happened. Uh, after him, of course, JT, you know, it, maybe it's in, uh, maybe it's, he's got a little connection. He seems to be the closest to Tiger on the tour. Maybe he goes out there and wins it for his friend this weekend. Who's to say? Uh, and then lastly, I got John Rahm, the Spaniard. Everyone likes a little bit of, a little spice in their life. And I like the Spaniard this weekend. John Rahm, rock it. Um, it's a good lineup. I, I'm a big Munoz guy. I love that pick. Love me some Sebastian. I've, uh, I've done a little bit more research on the event. It's actually a pretty grueling event. Uh, just the top 50 golfers uh, are invited, which means my favorite mm-hmm. golfer did not qualify for the first time in his career. He put on a surge at the end, but a bad Sunday here in this recent event keeps him out. Jordan Spieth, uh, you know, he needed uh, he needed to shoot a little better on Sunday. Unfortunately, Sunday also for him, I don't know if anyone was watching, uh, had uh, also 12 holes from round three because uh, – Round three was delayed. Mm-hmm. So he actually had yep. to play 30 holes on Sunday. And you know, he's the worst Sunday golfer of all time. So uh, he plummeted down the leaderboard, finished 15th when he was top five the whole weekend. Whatever. You know what? He's not in the event. So, you know, I can't possibly find a winner other than him. It's tragic. My big dogs, Finau, finished top five last three events. He's, you know, he's feeling it. Uh, I got. 
Dustin Johnson, a master of consistency. You just know what you're going to get out of him. And, you know, he doesn't even have to win for you to feel like he, he was fine. I mean, he's, he's just going to be up there. You know he will be. And then the 2015 winner of this tournament, nobody knows because he was the NCAA champion at this golf course, Bryson DeChambeau. Oh, boy. He's going to pull it back out. Go back to his college days, dominate the course. It is a course that can be beat with length. Uh, there's a lot of shortcuts on this course and some trees that, you know, aren't blocking that shortcut. So I think, you know, you can see a long ball here. Uh, you know, we went with Abraham answer. I see, you know, most people, most most reasonable people here felt like that was a, a solid pick. Uh, you know, he, he's just a good golfer. He's also consistent. I like consistent guys. I don't want a big mistake guy. That's although once you hear this next guy, I mean, Billy Horschel, uh, wow. the throwaway pick, you know, three of his last five events, he's, he's played extremely well. Um, the last two, however, you know, not, not great, but I see a bounce back performance, you know, you know, this is where these types of guys shine. You know, you go, Billy, who are you serious? Are you serious? And then I go with, you know, a seasoned vet, a guy who knows what he's doing. Adam Scott. And you know what? That's how you round it out. You go guy with two first names. Ah, that's a good pick. I, so I had Jim Furyk in my lineup last week and it was working out really well until Justin Thomas missed the cut. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My lineup went to hell after that happened. So, uh, it'll, it'll be fun. I guess uh, we'll come back next week and report how, uh, how our tournament is doing, but you know, yeah. and, as we know, I'm always happy to engage in some daily fantasy action here on Hot Stove. Now, uh, it's time to get into our main topic of the evening. We're going to do a bit of a uh, MLB offseason recap, talk about where things stand going into spring training. At this point, most, if not all, teams have reported. Um, spring training games start next week, so... That's a very exciting time to be a baseball fan. Uh, so we're going to talk about, we're going to jump around to some of the teams who had bigger off seasons, um, I guess. Um, you know, we're not going to touch everybody, but um, I have a few teams in mind. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what they did this off season, um, where we think they stand now within their division and the conference or in the, in the league and that kind of stuff. Uh, and we're, we're going to throw it over to Mark because this is going to be this is going to be one of those patented Mark Rowland shows, right? So, Mark, we're going to start in the AL in the American League. This is where, mm -hmm. where we'll start. Now, I want you. We're going to talk about two teams, and I want you to do a comparison here. Okay. Um, now they're very different off seasons, but I want you to compare where these two teams sit going into the season. Sure. Compare the jump that the White Sox have made, acquiring guys like Lance Lynn. Uh, and uh, why can't why am I not remembering Liam him? Hendricks? Liam Hendricks. Um, they acquired someone else that I can't remember. Uh, I don't remember. Anyways, Lance Lynn, Liam Hendricks. I'm literally looking at their transaction sheet right now, and I'm still blanking. That's that's the best part about it, right? Um, where do we think the White Sox sit in terms of the um? How do, how do I say this in terms of the cream of the crop in the American league and where do they sit specifically in relation to the Yankees who I think had one of the more interesting off seasons in baseball. So I'll get to the white Sox first, but I do have <clears throat> some thoughts on the Yankees off season. Uh, I think the white Sox are among the cream of the crop in the AL. I think they easily win that division. I think they've got the pitching. They've obviously got the offense with MVP winner Jose Abreu still in the middle of the lineup. You got Tim Anderson. You got, you know, you're hoping for a bounce back year from Yoan Moncada. Eloy Jimenez drops absolute nukes. Like, there's a lot of things to love in that offense and in that pitching staff with Keuchel, Giolito, Lance Lynn, Liam Hendricks. <clears throat> so I think they're one of the top two or three teams in the American League. Uh, and I think they'll show that, and I think they're a – favorite to at least reach the world series this year coming out of that league you want to talk about um, the disrespect i'm sorry i cut you off that the the white Sox have been facing did you see mlb's win projection totals yeah wasn't it like no. 83 from, from like a week ago I'll, I'll look and see if i can find the exact number but mlb's win projection totals had 
the White Sox finishing third in the division. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 83 and 79. Behind yeah. who? Yeah. Who were the other uh, two? Minnesota and Cleveland. Yeah, Cleveland. Yeah, Cleveland. Cleveland. Yeah. Cleveland. Yeah. Cleveland. Yeah. Cleveland. Uh, they just got rid of <laughs> Cleveland. Cleveland. But does Nelson Cruz make the bump for Minnesota? Is that the idea? He was already there. <laughs> oh, did they? Was he there last year? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought he was in. Oh, he jumps around. He does yeah, jump he around, does. but no, he's still there. Um, I, I, yeah. Okay. So I don't. I don't get it. I don't. Especially that, that was a, Cleveland. <laughs> Pagoda projections are always like way off for what the season actually entails. So, but the Yankees. I thought the Yankees did exactly what they needed to do. Almost. They needed to keep DJ LeMahieu. That was, that's priority number one this offseason. If I'm the Yank, if I'm Brian Cashman, is keep this guy in the lineup for the next few years. I mean, he's probably the best player on the team right now. You know, we haven't, we don't know, like, Judge is inconsistent, Stanton's inconsistent, Gary Sanchez stinks. Labor Torres is the only one I'll put up there in that in that conversation with him. But I I think lemayhew has got a little bit of an edge. So I, you know, when your best player goes up for free agency, obviously you're like, we got to keep this guy. And they did. And I thought that was the most important move they made this off season. And I think it's great that they kept him. And I really like the Corey Kluber pickup. It, at first I was like, ah, I don't know. He threw one inning last year and then got taken out of the game. Like I wasn't sure, but, there, there's something about Kluber where every time he gets counted out, he goes out and wins a Cy Young. Like, it's just, that's just what he does. I'm not saying he's going to win the Cy Young this year, but I, I think we're going to see a, a little bit of a renaissance for Corey Kluber. I'm, I'm thinking 175 innings, like a 3-5 ERA, good strikeout rate, like nothing spectacular, but a really solid number two sort of starter. And A lot of people were saying, oh, you know, they lost James Paxton, who stunk last year, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I like James Paxton, but I didn't hate losing him. Um, They just signed Brett Gardner to another deal, which I think is really stupid, but that's fine. They love him. They, they they the, love him. I knew they would. New York people can't get enough. He of is a tiny massive balding. locker room guy, and even though he doesn't have regular playing time at the moment, because uh, you know Quentin Frazier is the starting left fielder now, and uh, he which, should be. Which I don't know. I don't understand why people were like waiting. This is more so like a fantasy question. Why people were waiting so long to hear Aaron Boone say it when Quentin Frazier was already the starting left fielder last season. Anyways, yeah. Regardless, yeah. But and we know Brett Gardner is still gonna have like 300 something plate appearances because uh Judge and Stanton and Hicks can't stay healthy, so yeah, yeah and he's probably gonna share the needle with the locker room too, so yeah, that's fair. That that is very fair. <laughs> um, but I I like what the Yankees did this offseason, it was subtle, but that's all they needed. I don't think the Yankees need to go out and make that big move. I think so. You think the rotation's fine? I mean, if Kluber can be like what Keuchel had did this year with his kind of rehabbing year, or I think I think that's what the Yankees yeah, can. That's and best case, Yankees. right? That's absolute best case because Keuchel, yeah, yeah. He, he was a Cy Young finalist, right? You no, he wasn't the finalist, but he finished fifth, I think. Yeah, I think that's yeah. best case scenario for Kluber. yeah, that's the sure. absolute best case scenario. I don't think he'll get there i think he'll be a tier below that but i still think he'll be a solid number two because severino comes back this year at some you're, point you're, yeah some you're, point you're, over the summer yeah so, but you know. that's still like we all know, the baseball season isn't one in april you know like it, as long as the yankees i think if the yankees play like five games above 500 ball until july i think they'll be fine especially in that division because i'm still a little bullish on toronto um, okay. I, I still think they need one more year of development and then they'll be there uh, for guys like Guerrero and Bichette's there. And I'd like to see Kevin Biggio get a little more consistent contact wise. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I, I was going to, we were going to move to Toronto next actually. Yeah. So I, fi- I figured we would. So that's why I was, but not for nothing, but like, I'm just not sold that Kevin Biggio is all that good at this point. I, I like him. I like him a lot. He gets on base a ton. Yeah, he has really – It's I don't – but here's the thing. If you look at the numbers, I'm not sure it's a matter of – it's a, it's a 
I mean, obviously there's good plate discipline in there, right? Like to walk that much, you have to have good plate discipline. Mm-hmm. Mark, Mark throws. Uh, so, Mark, can you hear us still? Oh, you can see it lighting up. Uh oh. Anyway, gone. he's gone. Anyways, uh, it's the three of us right now, right? So, um, uh, speaking of Kevin Biggio, I mean, if you <laughs> if you uh, look at his numbers, obviously there has to be some sort of good point discipline in there to walk as much as he does, but almost equally. A lot of his walk rate is driven by the fact that he just doesn't swing at anything. Like his swing rate is so ridiculously low. Uh, yeah, I. Oh, Mark. He's back. I can. Wait, is he? You need to take your computer upstairs, dog. The <laughs> basement didn't it's work scary. out. <laughs> um, I, I could hear you. The. The what? Wait. Yeah, yeah, there, I can't you're hear back. you. And you're. I think he's back now. Yeah, he's back. He's back, back now, I guess. And it's gone. Am, am I back? Can you hear me? <laughs> I don't know. Fuck <laughs> it. Oh, come on. This is a family show, dude. Uh, I think the, the delay in the cut, it, it made it fine. <laughs> so um, that's that's my own personal gripe, I guess, right? And I, I Kevin Biggio is, is a strange case because he's – He's pretty – he's mildly efficient running the bases, but he doesn't run as often. And, like, obviously, you know, stolen bases are more a matter of intent rather than skill. Uh, you know, he can maybe be a 2020 guy, but also on top of that, his uh, quality of contact is, like, barely league average. So, like, that's up in the air, really. But he hits the ball in the air so damn often – that I guess it offsets it. I don't know. That's that's a different conversation for a different day, right? But I think uh, Toronto had quite the offseason, um, bringing in a host of people, notwithstand not or not uh, not excluding uh, George Springer and retaining Hyunjin Ryo and signing Kirby Yates, which I thought was a big a big underrated signing too, because I think a lot of people might have uh, counted Kirby Yates out um, given the injury that he had the end of his season with San Diego this past year. Um, but also that injury and that surgery are not necessarily related to Tommy John surgery. So Kirby Yates, as far as I know, should be good to go opening day. And if that's the case and he's healthy, he's still one of the best relievers in baseball. Um, and it's not like they didn't already have a closer who couldn't stay healthy anyways in Ken Giles. So, you know, um, I think – Toronto is going to be a fascinating team. And I think it all really hinges on, on some players getting better and some players not regressing in ways that they probably should in terms of actually competing this year. Like Teoscar Hernandez, for example, this past season probably played a fair bit over his head. Um, Lourdes Gurriel probably played a little bit over his head this past season. Meanwhile, Vlad Guerrero still hasn't quite made that jump that we expect him to. Um, and maybe moving over to first base full time will help, even though I know their manager had talked about recently about moving him back over to third base, uh, giving him a shot there. Um, you know, we're, we're just about to get into spring trading. So right now we're finally, we're just about to hear the uh, best shape of my life uh, kind of deal from literally everyone. So I don't know, maybe we'll see how that goes, but I, I, Vlad is so young enough as to where like, I'm not like panicking about him being like a really good player or anything like that. He still has elite, elite batted ball data. Um, it's really a question of lifting the ball more. His ground ball rate is super duper high. Yeah. Josh, you were about to say something. Did, uh, did the MLB announce like it should be normal schedules this year, right? There's no condensed season or anything. Is that. Yes. As far as I know, they haven't announced anything, but they are planning on playing a full season. So as far as I okay. know, we know this guy. I was just saying with, with that knowledge, I think this is kind of like the AL that we all grew up in for the most part, where I'd expect three teams in the American league East probably to be contending for three wild card spots or three playoff spots. And then your Houston, mm-hmm. Oakland, Minnesota are going to be battling for the wild card, like the last wild card, probably maybe if they can get in. I think, I think the three AL East teams are going to be probably the threeest, three most competitive in that, the wild card race. 
I think they're just going to be a dominant division again in, in baseball. Yeah, I'll, the, I do kind of think that, but in a different way. Uh, mostly because, like, I don't know what the hell is going on with the Raves, like, or the Rays. Like, I, 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 we were talking, I was talking with one of my housemates the other day about elite managers in baseball, and Kevin Cash was the first one that came to mind. So I'm not necessarily questioning it, I guess. Um, you know, and if they end up calling up Wander Franco, uh, like they should by the end of May, probably, and a Rosarena is even 75% as good as he was. Um, at the end of last season and their lineup should be just fine. I think their pitching staff is going to be fascinating to watch. Cause I think I remember correctly, Kevin Cash said that other than Tyler glass, now they have about eight or nine people that they want to get at least a hundred innings this season. Um, so mm-hmm. it's going to be really interesting to see how that parses out. And I still think they'll probably be good, but I'm wondering if they can add another arm, I think Coincidentally enough, I think Boston might be an interesting, like, sneaky uh, back end, like, compete for a wild card spot type team. Um, it's going to hinge on getting another guy in that rotation because, cur- as currently stands, it's poop garbage. But, um, well, yeah. here's the thing with the Red Sox, and this isn't like biased Red Sox, there is a rotation there. There is the makings of a decent rotation. And they got five guys Sales. who can throw a ball to the plate. So, yeah, there's a rotation. <laughs> Tail, <laughs> Tail should be fully healthy. And know if Chris Sale is fully healthy, what he can do. He's still an ace level pitcher. Until he pitches 75 so, innings and Tommy John again. Yeah, but I'm saying if he's fully healthy. Yes. If yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I got it. I'll give you that one. The, the ability is yeah. still there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all reports I've heard is he's 100%. He's ready for opening day. Like, they'll it, they'll have to ramp up his innings as the season goes on still, but he should be ready this year. Eduardo sure. Rodriguez is back. I like Erod. He's a solid number two pitcher. That's all we need him to be. Um, Martin Perez had a really good year last year, and I think he's going to regress from that. I don't think he's going to be the same guy that, had a solid year for Boston last year, but I could see him slotting in in the three or four spot along with Nathan Eovaldi. Eovaldi, once once again, he's still got the talent. He still throws hard. He's still got the movement. Like, so the talent's there. And then in the five spot, you can throw, I would like to see Tanner Houck in there. I would love to see him as our number five starter for the entire season because he's right-handed Chris Sale. Yeah, we've had that conversation on this show before. I've shown footage of it. It's Yeah. It's I, ridiculous, actually. <laughs> and, so I would love to see him as a number five starter for an entire season. So you take that rotation and you're like, there's something here. But then you get to the bullpen. And then that's ugh. that's where it falls apart. And Yikes. there's, you know, bullpens are so finicky these days. You never know when one of these guys is going to go out and have a 1-4 ERA with 35 saves. I'm done projecting relief pitchers. I can't do it. I never know when a relief pitcher is going to have a good year. And so one of these guys could have a really good year. And then all of a sudden the Red Sox are 85 to 90 win team, which is probably good for third in that division. Um, But the lineup's still there. I JD Martinez is going to bounce back. I've never been more sure of anything in my life that JD Martinez is not a 200 hitter. And Xander's really good. Endeavors is really good. And we got rid of my favorite player. And that makes me very upset. I'm seeing Andrew Benintendi leave. I almost cried when we traded Andrew Benintendi. I was more upset about the Benintendi trade than I was the Betts trade. That's how much I love Andrew Benintendi. That's the hill you're willing to die on is Andrew Benintendi. I, I'm not saying he's a great player. I'm saying he's my favorite. Like he, he is my favorite player to put on a Red Sox uniform since big poppy. It's just, that's the way it is. I loved everything about him. Um, I'm so, here for it. Bradley's gone. We added Hunter Renfro, who I like. He's pretty solid. Lefty Masher. Yeah. Hunter we got Renfro. Renfro. Yeah. There's two Hunter Renfros. Yeah. And yes, there's also a baseball there's... Hunter Renfro. Huh. No more much, much larger than football Hunter Renfro. <laughs> and somehow <laughs> younger than 17 year senior Hunter Renfro, wide receiver for the Las Vegas Braves. <laughs> Is he? He's not younger. I don't know. I, <laughs> no, I, I, there's no way. Hunter Renfro is like 29. I was like, there's no yeah. way. Uh, I love it. Verdugo's solid. 
we're going to have a full year of, I'm drawing a blank on his name. The, Bobby Dahlbeck. No, not, he, I was going to get to him. Michael Chavis. Um, Michael Chavis. Oh, brother, He's, that guy stinks. Yeah, no. I, there's a lot of power in that bat. He'll hit 240, but he'll hit his 28 home runs and stuff like that. So I'm fine with that. I, there's a lot of pieces on this team that could have them win 90 games, or they could also win 70 games. It's like, I, I don't know about the Red Sox this year, but I do like the pieces that are there. They just need a little help specifically in the outfield. The outfield I think is going to be rough this year. Yeah. And I, I, like I said, I think I'd like to see them, like if they want to actually compete, I'd like to see them add one or two arms, someone in the bullpen and then someone else in the rotation. There were 13 closers on the free agent market this year, and the Red Sox decided they needed none of them. Well, they traded for Adam Ottavino. Yeah, whatever. He had like a five and a half ERA last year. <laughs> he pitched like six innings. Still, we're not I, we're not using 2020 stats for relievers. Come on, Mark. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I like Adam Ottavino. I liked that deal. Uh, the only thing I didn't like about that deal is the, is the Yankees. Yankee. No, is the Yankees did it so they could free up salary for Brett Gardner. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that gotta, I think is stupid. <laughs> got to keep the clubhouse happy. What are you going to do, man? Not the vibes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Before we move on to the National League, and I do have – I have three teams I want to talk about the National League as well. Um, Austin, do you have anything to say about the American League? We haven't heard you all too much. Uh, yeah, I have a, you know, a team that's going to come out and shock the world. Um, is it the Tigers? It, it is going to shock the world because they might be the worst team I've <laughs> – ever seen uh, the Detroit Tigers <laughs> they're bad possibly going to throw out a bottom five lineup and rotation this year it it's honestly just embarrassing uh, I go through their lineup and it just I mean there's not a single player that's even projected to hit 25 home runs I mean look at really roster run. resource here there's uh, potential in that rotation I mean I certainly think there's potential in and growth potential in that rotation but i i just i i don't see any of these players sub for era this year i i, I don't see it I, I could see casey mize having a good year i i really like casey mize. oh boy I, this team sucks i could see casey <laughs> mize having a good year for a 22 year old and pitching in his really first season ever yeah like, i don't think it, I, i'm not saying i just two yeah. three era but who's I'm, the f- threes Who's the first tiger, and in what round does he get drafted in our fantasy league? I, I don't um, know that. I don't know that it, you do. It's going to be Shroop or Candelario. It but, should be it, uh, in terms of fantasy draft. I think it should be Scope, yeah. um, and it'll be a late, late round pick. I don't think I, I'm looking at their roster right now, and I can't imagine a single Tigers player that's actually going to get drafted in most standard leagues. Uh, no. Um, Scope or like, Renato Nunez, one of those two. I do like the, the, their philosophy this season is is more of a, like a, we're just going to get prospects as much time as we can on the field because this mm-hmm. is, is doomed, which I like that. But, I mean, I'm, we might see a team win 60 games or less. Uh, it's going to be ugly I, baseball. Wait, 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 wait. So the Tigers have updated their two most recent um, or their, their last two spots in the rotation. I don't know who they had last year, but this year they in the four and five spot they have Jose Urania and Julio Turan. They uh, just yeah. signed him. Yeah, they just. Yes. Signed him. Yeah, they. He's a, a minor league deal, I thought. They didn't really have a five last year. They kind of cycled it around to whoever was healthy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying I'm not saying that's actually what the uh, what the rotation will be like, but um, no, I, I'm that's what roster resources is projecting their starting rotation I mean, looks like. Oh, okay. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Tehran started opening day. Uh, no, that'll be Matt Boyd, even though he yeah, Matt, Matt Boyd's him. actually a decent player. Uh, he, he will either give up, go six scoreless, or go, you know, three, give up seven or eight. So, you know, I mean, don't disrespect that young man. Uh, yeah, when Miguel yeah. Cabrera Boyd's in 2021 okay. is going to be batting third or fourth in your lineup, I mean, there's uh, – what can you say about this roster? <laughs> I'm uh, just I, I, yeah. the roster may look bad right now. The next four or five years for the Tigers should be very exciting. Yeah, they, they do have a good uh, farm. I system. love Spencer Torkelson. 
They have yeah. Russell. Just wow, that's got a real hipster pick, loving the number one overall pick in 2020. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not saying it's a hipster pick. I'm just saying I think the guy's really good. Like, <laughs> uh, two quick things. One, Mark Luca just hit a buzzer beater on the Celtic. Oh, oh, I saw yeah. it. Trust me, I told Nunez the lead didn't matter, okay. and it didn't. Uh, two, um, we we touched on him earlier, but I didn't get to say it. The White Sox have the most intriguing storyline to me in the MLB this season, hiring Tony La Russa. Like, oh, yeah. I just, the craziest thing. And, like, I saw Tim Anderson, I think it was, that came out this week and was like, yeah, we're totally in on it. Like, this guy's a winner. We're, let's, fu- let's win. Let's win. No, he's really going to whip him into shape. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. It's not my fault the guy's racist. What do you want me to do? What Is he really? I, I didn't know I don't that. Care. I didn't know. I mean, I wouldn't put it past 75 or 80 year old Tony, Lur- but like, is he actually? Is that a thing? I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know it was a thing either. It's, I do believe it though. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not out really of a thing. possibility. It, it's like not really a thing, but it's kind of a thing. Like, it, we say Jerry Jones is racist. Like, it. I feel like he'd be just yeah, creepy surprised. about like things he'd be. say. Like we, you know, my, yeah, that's they're really playing good and be like, you can't say my boy. Like, you can't uh, there's an, I, I mean, I don't yeah. know concrete. I was just kind of been kind of like joking here, but like there are people yeah. from when he originally retired. There's an article here from '99 of like his former players <laughs> accusing him of being racist in the in the clubhouse and whatnot. Yeah, now that Josh says that, he does strike me as a guy who's like, come on, boy. We yeah, all doing like, over there, boy. sort of like that. Yeah, I mean, we like that old timey bigotry. Am I right, everybody? Anyways, um, <laughs> just okay. uh, one quick thing: the guy who used to own the Mariners, uh, Pound Sand. Oh yeah, fuck that guy. I I forgot his name. I don't care. I just he deserves to rot in hell. I don't give a shit what his name is. This is the the strongest take I have on. All right, so what he said was really bad. All right. But you can't say bad things about Latino and Japanese players when two of the best four players in your franchise's history are Edgar Martinez and Ichiro Suzuki. I, I, I hate to be that guy. Um, it, it's bad anyway, but also read, like, know a single thing about your organization. It know got, how well, you, he, those guys are. Here's the thing. He's the dude – is a rich white man who owns a baseball team. Do you think he cares? No. Obviously not. I think it was Passon who wrote the article on ESPN. Mm-hmm. And, yes. and, like, I read it, and it was, like, it got progressively worse. Like, at first, yeah. he's like, yeah, I didn't want to pay the translator, and I was like, okay. I, I, I guess, bottom line guy, yeah. And then he's like, and then this Mexican, this, and this, and I'm like, oh. oh. He called Hispanic players lazy. Yeah, I was like. <laughs> Now it got it got so much worse. Just like every little quote throughout it. Like I love the article name. It was like the forty five minutes that ruined his life or something. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, I is- so I filled out an application for an internship a couple of days ago, and they asked me like who um like whose content I follow, uh, okay. in terms of like sports content. And in mm-hmm. terms when I was writing about print, I wrote down Jeff Passan. Like I just admire his writing so much. He's so good. But he is. He's very friend good. of the show, Jeff Passan, if you will. Um, Respect. I just, I just want. I mean, talk about a moron. Outside of Ken care. Griffey Jr., there are not two more beloved players in the Pacific Northwest than Edgar Martinez and Ichiro Suzuki. And he goes out and calls Hispanic players lazy and says he doesn't like having Japanese players on the roster. They're the biggest farm club of Japanese talent, too. Yeah, the, like, yeah. they signed Jose makes... Kikuchi two years ago. Yeah, dude, it, it's an absolute troll. Like, that it's guy, that guy it's, honestly, it's better for them to just move on. And I felt bad for the VP now, whoever took over, or maybe it was the actual owner who was like, I don't know what to say. Like, I, <laughs> I, I, got mole, I don't know what to say. He's gone. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know. He, which he knew he says stuff like that, obviously, but he's like, what are you doing? Like, I love that conversation afterwards. Like, what the hell did you just do? It's funny because it wasn't that? really reported until he resigned. I saw yeah. stuff about this like a week ago where just Mariners fans on Twitter, like going like, can we fire this guy? Like, yeah. Did, did yeah. he get out of here? Yeah. And then it finally got reported. And I was like, thank God this is a story. But it, it was just 
every like baseball tweet I read, it was all Mariners fans in the like yeah. in the replies just going like, yeah, um, our owner said he doesn't like Hispanic players and he owns a baseball team. So <laughs> he doesn't like Hispanic players or Asian people. Yeah. He like, owns a baseball. <laughs> yeah, dude. I don't know. Like, I don't know. <laughs> guys, guys, he really won for it, dude. I don't know. Yeah. Respect. Well, I appreciate that that piece of shit is gone. Uh, I do as well. So you oh, we can prove that maybe in some cases you can't act without impunity if you have a lot of money in the sports world. I don't know. Yeah. Fuck that guy. That's all I got to say. Anyways, moving on to the National, National League. League. Um, there are two big teams to talk about here. We know who they are. The Padres and the Mets had the two biggest off seasons here in the National League. Um, I also wanted to talk about the Braves, and we'll get to that. But uh, I, I got one more team too. Oh boy, you, so you started them. What's your team? The Cardinals. The Cardinals with the Arenado trade. Arenado, they kept Yadier Molina. Like it, this. Oh, they kept thirty-nine-year-old Yadier Molina. Here we go. <laughs> like no, but keeping Molina and Wainwright is one of those things where it's it's Brett Gardner. Mark, it's I know we've had thing. this conversation, this very conversation on the show multiple times. So, like, I, you know, good for the clubhouse, whatever. Neither of them are going to be that good this year. But the Arenado trade, it was like, it was a really big deal for like three days. And then people were like, okay, Arenado is a cardinal. Where the Francisco Lindor deal is like still the most talked about trade this offseason. No one, Aaron, Austin knows better than anybody. No one Arenado is an incredible baseball yeah. player. Like, th- and they got him for dirt cheap. And they've got him for the next, what, six years? And now your corner infielders are Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado with Paul DeYoung and Tommy Edmond up the middle. That might be the best infield in baseball. I mean, props to the Cardinals for uh, is- outside of the Padres. <laughs> Yeah, Do you saying, have another was, team? That. That, that team's the only team in that division who's actively trying to win, which I've said. Yeah. Show. But, like, props to them for acknowledging that their window is closing with, like, guys like Wainwright and Molina, who are old and mean nothing now. Wainwright, by the way, was sneaky really good in the last – He was Like, great. since the start of 2019. Yeah. yeah. He's, been, he's been great for them. And like, I don't see him, like, falling off a cliff. I think he's going to have another really solid year. Molina, yeah. whatever. But – He's just there to uh, – to, they've got a young catcher coming up, and I can't think of his name right now, but he's there as more of a mentor role, um, I feel, for that guy. But, yeah, I mean, the Cubs – like, what the hell are the Cubs doing? You got all this young talent, and they're just like, yeah, we don't need it. Starting the rebuild, that's what they're doing? Yeah, and I, I think that's a lot of why Theo left. He was like, no, nah, I don't rebuild. See, I go to the teams that are rebuilding – and then I make them win a World Series earlier than they should. Like, so it makes sense as to why Theo left, but it's like, you still have Chris Bryant, you have Javi Baez, you have Nico Horner, you have Ian Happ, you have Anthony Rizzo, you have Wilson Contreras, and all I heard all offseason was, when are the Cubs going to trade Chris Bryant? I'm like, the guy's 26 and he's already won an MVP. Why do you need to trade this guy? And so the Cubs are actively trying to lose. The Pirates stink. The Reds did absolutely nothing. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you, Austin. I appreciate your – I'm sorry to cut you off. I appreciate your sentiment about the Tigers, but I'm not convinced the Pirates yeah. are on the most baseball yeah. team. The Pirates are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's yeah, that's but, very true. Mark, not only as a Reds fan, but, like, imagine any team from that playoffs last year. Like, even the Marlins went out and signed – it was an Adam Duvall, right? Like the Yeah, Mar- they made a couple moves. Like – any team that is that close and like it's the same thing with the Cardinals. Like they've got guys like Votto and even on their pitching staff that are aging and getting old. They don't they don't resign Bauer. They they refuse to trade anyone and get any level of value. And it's I don't know what it is. Did you see Votto's thing the other day too? What he no, said? I didn't. It was like, yeah, the plate vision is great and all, but basically hitting home runs is more fun. I gotta get my power back. He said he Go wants power back and he's like i'm just i'm just gonna try and start hitting dingers again it's more Good. fun <laughs> okay i hate to interrupt you but i'm looking at roster resource right now and i gotta tell you this this pirates projected rotation 
Oh boy. They don't have a single guy who's projected for an ERA better than a four, three, four. What do we got for the starting rotation? All right. So opening oh, projected Tyon opening day Yankees. starter. What is that? Oh my. I forgot about the J- Jameson Tyon trade to the Yankees. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. Also a great move. Continue. Uh, projected opening day starter is Steven Brault. Uh, who's <laughs> oh, projected. No. Who's projected for a four, seven, two ERA. Um, day two starter, Chad cool. Who's projected for a four, uh, seven, yep. four ERA. No three starter Tyler Anderson, recently signed free agent, uh, who's projected for a team high four seven nine ERA. Uh, day four starter Mitch Keller, who uh, you know might be good at some point, is projected for a four four nine, yeah. and then day five starter JB Brubaker, who's projected for a four three four. I, I wow. do like Mitch Keller. So that's I thought, a, I'm going to be honest with you. Single bright. I thought party, they so. still had 49 year old Francisco Liriano on that team. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really did. I, I didn't know. He yeah. was somewhere last year. Even the that. Pirates went and they traded Josh Bell just for good measure to make sure they really stink this year. They yeah the, power hitter away to the Nationals. That's I mean listen, that's passion. Cabri- Cabrian Hayes better be that dude. I mean, he had a really good year last year, but I don't know who owns and GM like general manager of the Pirates, but they should be gunned down. Like <laughs> hold him in front of Roberto Clemens uh, bridge, Roberto Clemens bridge and have a public execution for the- <laughs> right outside of the stadium. I, he I don't know who managed his team horribly. I don't know who the the owner is, but the GM is Ben Charrington, former general manager of the Boston Red Sox during the Bobby Valentine and John Farrell years. Like they're Uh, within a decade of being good, right? McCutcheon, Neil Walker. They they were so close. They made the three offs. They made the playoffs three straight years. They were so close. They just needed a a little tweaking. And then they were just like, get rid of it. I don't want it. I don't want to win. Absurd. Uh, you Absurd. know, I was making fun of the Tigers' uh, lack of home run hitters. Uh, the 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 Pirates don't have a guy who's projected to hit twenty home runs this year. Uh, Colin Moran is absolutely going to hit like twenty five. That guy. I don't not, know. Their I'm cleanup not hitter is projected seventeen. Brian Reynolds. Is that a joke? B- Brian Ooh. Reynolds is good. No, that guy's good. He's an outfielder. He was on that same Vanderbilt team with like. Walker Bueller and Dansby Swanson and like he was on uh, those loaded Vanderbilt teams. I'm gonna be honest, the only person that I'm really excited for on this Pirates roster is Cabrian Hayes. I like I like Hayes too. Yeah. But they're gonna stink, dude. I mean, they're yeah. gonna be so bad. Sorry, the, the, the real three teams we're supposed to be talking about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Um well first let's talk about the Padres. Uh-huh. Uh Padres have had an impressive offseason, um, signing Tatis to the third biggest deal in baseball history, uh, which ended up being a team-friendly deal given the $24 million average annual value for the man who has shown every sign of being the face of baseball for the next 15 years uh, at the age of 22, and they were able to sign him for what, again, comes as a discount, especially given inflation moving forward. Then... So not only do they re-sign Tatis, but they go out and trade for Victor Caratini as part of the U Darvish deal. Forgot about that one, honestly. Uh, let's see. They also went and signed Korean import Ha Seong Kim, which is a fascinating case because he's not like an other Korean, like a lot of other Korean imports come in at their like their eight, like their late twenties or whatever. Ha Seong Kim is twenty five. Mm-hmm. He's coming off of multiple seasons of like. 300 batting average. Let me see if I can pull up the stats here from the Korea yeah. baseball league. He's like a, he's projected to be like in the States, like a 280, 15 home runs sort of guy. Yeah. Last year in the KBO, he hit 306 with 30 home runs and 23 steals. Mm-hmm. Uh, the previous year, he hit 307 with 19 home runs and 33 steals. So, I mean, he profiles as a high batting average, power speed threat, 25 years old. And he signs and he he can play everywhere. Uh, And he signs with the Padres and then whatever the hell they did with their rotation. uh, And, and and also 
their 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 bullpen. Like they they didn't sign Trevor Rosenthal. Trevor Rosenthal he went to go close in Oakland, but they did make up for it by signing both Mark Melanson and Keone Kella, uh, mm-hmm. two closer level talents uh, to to act as middle relievers. They traded for Yu Darvish, Blake Snell, and Joe Musgrove to make up for the fact they're not going to have Clevenger this year. Uh, and we still don't know really the status of Denilson Lamette. Um, they've still got Mackenzie Gore uh, and Luis Patino waiting in the wings. Um, yeah. I mean, this team, good for them, man. <laughs> like, it, it reminds me of the Padres off season a few years ago when they signed all those bad players. <laughs> um, but, but, it was like, oh man, AJ Preller, he's he's going out, he's making moves. They got Matt Kemp, they got the Upton brothers, they got James Shields. It was like this <laughs> Padres team is gonna be a problem. And then they realized, wait, all these guys are getting old and aren't very good. Um, and so AJ Preller learned his lesson and he was like, Okay, we'll get some younger guys and we'll keep our guys. And you know, they had there was the Machado signing and the Hosmer signing. So they were starting to build this core of young enough guys that will be good for three to four years. And then the, the, they get Tatis and the Shields trade, and they're like, wait a minute, this guy's going to be good. Still can't believe he was traded for James Shields, um, the man who gave up a home run to Bartolo Colon. Uh, <laughs> there's a couple guys who've given up a home run to Bartolo Colon. That guy's a fear that bad. No, there aren't. No, <laughs> actually, one, my housemate sent me a video earlier today of but I'm not him hitting a home run in the Dominican backyard of some dude's league. dirt pit. That's, so. that's a professional league in like Venezuela. But oh, really? sure it is. Yeah, he just. Mark, what are you trying to say about you know Latino ball players? Okay, I'm, I'm just not saying anything. Yeah, because mm-hmm. he's saying. Fernando Tatis is incredible. <laughs> also, before I go refill my water bottle, I'd like to say, and Mark, you keep talking about this, the only person on the Padres opening day roster who the Padres either drafted or signed as an international free agent was Denilson Lamette. Everybody else they traded for or signed as a free agent post-draft. So, mm-hmm. Good for that. Yeah, I mean, it's the Yankee model. It's the 1990s Yankees model where it's like, all right, we'll have like these couple of guys who are really good that we brought up and the rest of them just sign them. And guess what? It works. It yeah. works. <laughs> When's the last time we saw two teams from the same division be the clear one-two favorites in their league? I don't know. It's got to be. Probably a Yankees Red Sox. And like yeah, a- for me, it's the 2018 Yankees Red Sox. Oh, that's true. Um, but, and – the but even then, the, the Dodgers Yankees. were so good in 2018 then. Like, it's kind of. Yeah, but, it, that, but yeah, that and level. the Dodgers were up there too, and the Astros beat the Yankees in the playoffs. So it was like yeah. there, there were a lot of things going in. But this – I'm so excited for this Padres team, dude. I mean, this is I, – I love the Tatis deal. I was surprised because I thought they would extend him for an Acuna-type deal, like the 8-105. and 105. Like – Let's give this guy some financial security. He can still test free agency. That's what a lot of young guys want nowadays is like, yeah, you know, I'll still, I still want to go into free agency. I still want to get that really big paycheck. And Tatis was like, oh no, I'm a Padre. Yeah. Which no one has said that since Tony <laughs> Gwynn. So that was very surprising. That um, was great. That was a great team friendly contract. It was. Yeah. Like Nunez had 25 million, which I think it's very funny that Tatis, in my opinion, is still the third best player in California. And he's the t- face of baseball. Yeah. <laughs> like he's not even like you'd be as you got. Trout, obviously, and Mookie Betts, who I'd still put ahead of Tatis. He's the third best player in his well, state. And, and Trevor Bauer. I mean, I man. All right. He won a Cy Young for the Reds in a 60 game season. We get it. Uh, <laughs> but it's so, like this guy has everything a young star in any sport should have. He's got the personality, he's got the talent, he's got the market. San Diego, like, they're finally acting like the big market team that they are. They didn't for a long time. They were just mm-hmm. like, oh, we're the Padres. We don't have any money. We're only in San Diego, California, where there's a million, like millions of people and it's 75 and sunny every day. We're not marketable. 
shut up, San Diego. Yes, you are. Um, and they're finally acting like it. And it, I think it's going to result in a World Series win in the next three years. I'm not going to say this year, but th- their window is right now. And they're, I can almost guarantee that the Padres are going to win the World Series. There's just there's too much talent not to. That's what we were saying sure. about the Dodgers the past few years. And then the Dodgers actually did it. It's going to take a couple of years probably, but they're going to get over the hump and win the World Series. And I, this is easily going to be my favorite team to watch this year. I'm so excited. All right. Well, let's move uh, and kind of close this out. We're going to talk about the National League East uh, at large. First, I want to talk about the Mets and their offseason. And then we're going to talk about the Nationals and uh, how I think in a similar lane to Boston, even though I think they have a better roster than Boston, don't. Don't put words in my mouth. I mean, the Nationals are better. Um, they they have a sneaky chance to make a make a competitive run this year from the moves they made this offseason. But the first of all, the Mets uh, kind of owned the offseason. New ownership coming in, making the Lindor deal. I think it's still hilarious that in the true fashion of New York sports, uh, Mets fans thought they were going to get Bauer and Springer and Brad Hand and ended up with none of them. Um but hey. No, instead they got a great 26, 26 oh. year old shortstop. <laughs> and Real Muto. I forgot about that. And Real Muto. They're going to sign JT Real Muto. Uh, <laughs> they, had, they got Lindor. They the best catcher in baseball. You know, nothing, nothing big. Uh, they got they made the Lindor trade. Got Carlos Carrasco with it, which I think is a is a super underrated part of that deal. <laughs> great, great deal to get Carrasco. I yeah, mean, like, yeah, man. Uh, he was fantastic last year coming off of his, uh, his leukemia. Um, and you know, um, yeah, I don't know about that, but they just signed Taiwan Walker yesterday. Uh, I love Nick Walker. Yeah. I think he's pretty good. I think what's really underrated here is the work that the Mets did to, uh, add more pieces to their bullpen, signing Trevor May, Aaron Laup, Jacob Barnes, um, and Mike Montgomery. I think mm-hmm. signing those four guys to like bolster the bullpen so they can have Seth Lugo, who uh, is probably going to start the year on the injured list from what it looks like. Um, have him kind of bounce around between, you know, a six starter an opener, maybe, uh, you know, a, bull, a middle bullpen arm, a long relief kind of guy. Um, having him, having the flexibility to be able to have him bounce around and use him in high leverage situations uh, is going to be really effective for that Mets bullpen. But how do you think the Mets are going to stack up um, in terms of the division and in terms of the rest of the national league this year. <laughs> I think the NL East is really tough because the Braves are the best team in the NL East. I, it, the Mets made a lot of great moves this off season. It's, it's the Braves division. Yeah. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And, but it's, it's another one of those things where you look at the pieces on the Mets. I, a lot of people disagreed with me on this. I really like the James McCann deal at four years, forty eight million. Like you're getting him at a cheap enough price. He's the last two and a half years. He's been great. Like it's not just like oh he had a good sixty game season. No, he's been really good the past two and a half years. Just not enough people are paying attention, including the people on the White Sox who didn't play him as much as they should have. Um, but. I really like that contract. I didn't think they needed Real Muto. I thought a guy like James McCann would be perfect. Uh, they didn't get Springer, which I'm fine with. They just got Kevin Pillar, who is a solid enough center fielder. He's not the bat first kind of guy that Springer is, but he's a, still a solid defender, not as good as he used to be. Um, and he'll hit you 20 home runs. Uh, then you get guys like, you know, you still got Conforto. You still got Nimmo. You add Lindor and Carrasco. To, you add Carrasco to a rotation that, like, David Peterson's going to be their number five starter, and he had, like, a 3-3 ERA last year when he pitched for the Mets. And you still got a lot of guys coming up in that minor league system. So that rotation is going to be scary for the next few years. Syndergaard's coming back healthy. You still have arguably the best pitcher in the National League in Jacob deGrom. No, 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 let's, let's put a pause on that. Arguably not arguably the best pitcher in baseball. Yeah, like, it, I was just saying, like, there, Trevor Bauer is still nationally. He just won the Cy Young. Like, there's there's guys that Did you could be argued to put it. I, I'm, I think Jacob DeGrom is the best pitcher in baseball. I, I just, not did you, I, no, no, no. I wasn't going to question you on that. I was yeah. just saying, did you see the reports today that he's already hitting 99? 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Incredible. No problem. The guys... I mean, They've been there for like four days. <laughs> yeah, he's... Jacob DeGrom, for every year he throws harder. It's one of the craziest things. Like, when he came up, I remember he was like, oh yeah, DeGrom, he sits 93 to 95. And it's like, oh yeah, he's got some life on his fastball, you know, a little bit of movement. He'll be able to get out. Now he's living at 99. And it's... I've never seen anything like it, where every year he throws harder. I... I wouldn't be surprised if he averaged a hundred on his fastball this year, <laughs> throwing 230 innings. Like, but Syndergaard's coming back, DeGrom, Carrasco, like uh, there's one other guy. Who am I forgetting? Steven Matz is out. Um, Steven Matz is out. Um, I'm looking at it right now. Um, Marcus Stroman. Stroman. Yeah, Stroman, of course. Um, so that's four – guys who in the past have been legitimate aces like Carlos Carrasco was the best pitcher for Cleveland Marcus Stroman was the best pitcher for Toronto Syndergaard and DeGrom have both had their turns as the best pitcher in New York so like it that's four guys who could legitimately go out there and contend for a Cy Young um and this team's gonna be really good and they're gonna finish second and they're gonna get a wild card and they're probably going to lose because they're the Mets. And it's really disappointing because Francisco Lindor should be one of the faces of baseball. There's a reason they call him Mr. Smile. He's the happiest person to have ever played baseball. Um, and they're going to be really good. And it's kind of disappointing that they're not going to win the division. <laughs> well, it's disappointing they're not going to win the division. I'm not even, I mean, they'll probably, I mean, they'll compete for a wild card spot, but it's no guarantee because you got a team that I want to kind of move forward to. That's the Washington nationals. Um, they lost Adamy in this off season, a couple other players here or there. Uh, Andrew Bull Cabrera, a few others. Like. Yeah. Andrew Bull, Andrew Bull Cabrera's Josh Harrison is a, is apparently still with the team. I don't know, man, but the important part is that they traded for Josh Bell and resi- or, and signed Kyle Schwarber added him adding they're going to add both of those lineups or bats to the middle of the lineup that already includes Trey Turner, who's a legitimate 50 steel threat. Um, and Juan Soto, who has a case to be made for the best hitter in baseball at the moment. So, uh, you know, that top of the lineup is going to be spooky, scary. Uh, they still have probably the best one, two, three punch in, in baseball in terms of their rotation with Scherzer, Corbin and Strasburg. They signed John Lester, Okay, then uh, the back end of their rotation isn't great, but they did also make the moves to go sign uh, Jeremy Jeffress and Brad Hand this offseason mm-hmm. to be their new closer after Sean Doolittle is poo garbage. Uh, Tanner Rainey also had a really good season last year. So I think Nats are going to be pretty, pretty interesting. What do you, what do you think, Mark? I think Dave Martinez is a great manager. I think that there's a lot of talent on this team, but I think there's too many holes. I really like the bell trade and I really like the Schwarber signing as like preliminary pieces, but I think the lineup is missing one more guy. Well, yeah, you'll know, you'll know that I didn't mention anybody past the four hole in the lineup. Yeah. Like I, I, I think they need one more legit guy in the lineup is Trey Turner is great, obviously. Well, he's said 50 steals, right? And he's, at, he's added some more pop to his game, too. He's hitting more home runs than he used to um, while maintaining around a 300 average. So that's a really good leadoff guy. And Juan Soto is obviously incredible. The things he's done at his age are only comparable. I saw it was like to Mike Trout, Ted Williams, and like just insane things he's done at his age. Um, Bell... I don't know because there was that first half of the season he had two seasons ago where I was like, Oh, Josh Bell might mess around and win an MVP. And then the second half, he had like 200 to six home runs. And then last year he wasn't yeah. very good. And so it's like, which Josh Bell are we going to get? And say, sort of the same with Kyle Schwarber. I mean, Schwarber came up, he was dropping bombs. He like, I, I really like Kyle Schwarber. I think he's better in left field than people give him credit for too. He's not great, but he certainly isn't terrible. He's an average left fielder. Um, and so I like those guys, but 
you've got two legit bats in your lineup. Two guys that I'm sure are going to be really good. The rest of them, I'm not so sure. So you're a little higher on the Nats than I am because the pitching obviously is great. But I we might be looking at a like a 2018 DeGrom situation with like Strasburg where he goes 12 and 10 if he stays healthy, obviously, where he goes 12 and 10 with a 2-4 ERA it, because the Nationals score three runs a game. Like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's certainly possible. Um, before we before we wrap here, Josh Austin, do you guys have any uh, thoughts on the National League, the teams that we've talked about today? Like, what are, what are you thinking? I think um, that, uh, Juan Soto is mm-hmm. going to win MVP. That's going to be my. I, I think he might as well. Right now, I, I think and I, yeah. And I think Josh Bell struggles. Um, I understand every at bats. I mean, it's an individual type of game, but I think the players around you in a lineup influence each and every at bat. I think people not getting on base. I think pitchers not having to really give their best to just putrid players that Josh Bell's been playing with makes every at bet he's in harder because pitchers just game plan for him. I think if if you see a good season from Schwarber and the one, two, three is those three guys before Bell, I think you he could be in a really, really good spot to have a really good season. Um, but yeah, I mean, it does seem like a scary lineup if Schwarber and Bell just hit 200. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's it does seem a little bit scary, but we know, all know I love Strasburg. So actually, I think the Nationals will be good too, and I think that entire division is just really good. I mean, if the Marlins play at least partially as good as however they did what they did last year, I yeah, mean, they could just, be a five hundred team. That's just going to be an annoying division because they, I mean, they could have five teams win seventy five games, and that's like, I mean, that's yeah. just unheard of. Those five teams are going to beat each other up all season. Yeah, we didn't even mention the Phillies. Like, yeah, the yeah. the Phillies are still solid. Like, I I think I'm higher on the Phillies than everyone else is. Yeah, like, I'm probably also lower on the Phillies than I've been, been high Phillies on the Phillies for the past two years. So yeah, I, I have been. I have to jump off it, but <laughs> I mean, I I think Real Muto is obviously huge for them to keep him. Um, he is the best catcher in baseball and ha- having the best catcher in baseball is such an important thing to have. Um, Harper, like people are always like, Oh, he hit two sixty again. Yeah. But he had a four fifteen on base. Like, yeah. And so if you look at, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off again. If you look at Harper's uh, advanced stats from last year, his batted ball data was even better than his MVP season last year. Yeah, exactly. And he, and he dropped his strikeout percentage by 10%. There's a big mm-hmm. season coming for Bryce Harper this year. Bryce Harper, he's another one. Like, watch out for him. Like, I, I actually agree with Austin. I think Juan Soto is going to win MVP this year. Because he's either, depending on how Bell and Schwarber do, he's either going to hit 340 with 40 home runs and 90 RBIs or 340 with 40 home runs and 130 RBIs. <laughs> so, like, there's <laughs> – he's going to be right around those numbers, I think. But Harper, it's just – he was so good last year, and no one talked about it because of the batting average. He might do that thing again where it's just like, oh – my BABIP is where it should be for how hard I consistently hit the ball. And I'm hitting 320 and I have 45 home runs and 140 RBIs. Like, yeah, it might I, be, it might end up being a y'all must have forgot season for Bryce yeah, Harper. I'm Harper. sort of thinking that's coming because he's been like, people have made like, have talked shit about him ever since he signed with Philly. Yeah, he's one of the most hated players in the league. And he's one yeah. of my favorites. Like, I like I've him loved too. him ever since he came up. I love Bryce Harper. He plays his ass off. Mm-hmm. And he, I get he's a little cocky at times. If you were the most recruited high school baseball player in the history of the sport, you would also be pretty cocky. <laughs> he was on the cover of Sports <laughs> Illustrated when he was yeah. 15, hitting 500-foot home runs out of Marlins Park. <laughs> like, that was aluminum. It's aluminum, dude. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I could have done that. One. Okay, they'll only go 450 when you put wood in his hand. Like, yeah. It, it's what it was, yeah, I would be cocky if I was Bryce Harper, too. So, I, I don't care. The the only thing I have to say in the National League, and I don't think we really touched, was that uh, I, I just think the Dodgers won free agency, in my mind. They were the best. Be- by getting Bauer? Well, they were the they were already the best team to yeah. add the Cy Young. 
Like that's, I, that's that's just the ultimate pe- like they didn't need to do anything really in my mind. And then they were like, you know what? Let's just go out and pay the highest pitcher contract we can think of. <laughs> and uh let's just hope it works out. Honestly, I just love pain. And yeah. he's only with me for one season. We gave him the all the rehabilitation he needed after what probably could have just been his falling out party. He came dominated. I loved him. And then he spit in my face and I just want more. I just want more. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I still thank so you, Trevor. Bad for the other teams in that division, by the way. Like, yeah. Who's, oh, like the D-backs and stuff? Yeah. The, like The Rockies, just, like, Giants, and Diamondbacks are so There's screwed. no point in playing. Like you got to play 40 games against those two teams. You win maybe like five to 10 against them. And then yeah. like. Hopefully the Rockies help out Trevor's story. A zero percent chance you make the playoffs. It's yeah, it's the Rockies possible. are going to be like bad this really year. Really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we've been talking about rotations most of the night. We didn't even mention that Clayton Kershaw is now a number three starter. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, they're going to have the best the Dustin pitcher May. I've ever seen. <laughs> Oh God! Dustin May is the best pitcher I've ever seen, and he's gonna oh, be that guy's a, nuts. He's gonna be what, like a three inning guy, fifth in the yeah. Rotation. He he yeah. is not gonna have a spot in the rotation. <laughs> yeah, like it, yeah. the best the best pitcher of our lifetimes <laughs> is the number three starter for the Los Angeles Dodgers. After a good season, off a yeah, good coming season. off a re- coming off a, a fantastic great season. season. His yeah. what what was the two years ago? What was it like three oh three was uh, his yeah. highest ERA since his rookie season? <laughs> I got his stats right here, I can tell yeah. you. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was a three oh three in twenty nineteen. He bounced back last year, by the way, and had a two one six ERA um <laughs> in ten starts. I mean the the guy's nuts in I I don't know if he starts opening. Oh well, he will start opening day. But I think it's fair to say he's not the best pitcher in that rotation. And that's wild. Yeah. Yeah. So that's our, that's our recap of the off season. I think we'll, we'll call it there. Um, yep. We've been going for just over an hour, like an hour and 15 at this point. So normal, mm-hmm. normal episode sure. time. Anyways, um, that was a good episode. It was a good episode. I thought we had quite the good time there. Anyways, um, uh, Make sure to come back next week. Next week we'll be doing our NBA midseason review uh, ahead of the All Star break. So uh, tune in for that. In the meantime, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Hot Stove Pod. Hot Stove Pod on Twitter. Make sure to smash the follow button on YouTube. Make sure to smash the like button on YouTube. Make sure to smash the notification button on YouTube. And make sure to leave a comment if you feel like commenting. And if you want to join the Hot Stove MILB Invitational on Yahoo Fantasy. We're doing, again, we're doing our fantasy draft for that on March 23rd. So make sure one month from today. We are doing our fantasy baseball draft for the season. So make sure to join. That goes for you as well, Austin and Josh. Make sure to join the league because uh, you haven't yet. Um, but in the meantime, we that's not cap. We will see you. Uh, yeah, I just refreshed it. You're, you're capping, Austin. Um, we will see you next week. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We love you. Goodbye, everybody. Yep.